everybody and welcome to the Bible in a Year Challenge Instagram Live going live tonight at 6.15 Pacific Standard Time rather than our normal time, 5.15 Pacific Standard Time. And as you see right behind me here, I've got my sanctuary set and now my beautiful grayscale set of the Conflict Beautiful put together by Types and Symbols. The reason I went live tonight at 6.15 is because uh, David Ashrick, a good friend of mine, is doing the OT with DA starting at 6 o'clock Mountain Time, which means that the one hour that he does live every day as he's going through the Conflict series starts at 5 p.m. That means a lot of uh, the people who have been doing our Bible in a Year Challenge with us um, are going to be busy during that time, and so I'm trying to have this live occur during a time which uh, doesn't go live at the same time as the OT with DA, um, and makes it possible for people who are trying to do both the Bible in a Year and the OT with DA challenge at the same time, it makes it possible for them to get in on um, the OT with DA live and also to come on here and be a part of this live about the time the OT with DA is wrapping up. So uh, I'm actually going to be looking for possibly doing this at a different time other than 515 Pacific Standard Time. But I would love to hear back from everybody that's doing the Bible in a Year Challenge. Um, if 515 Pacific Standard Time is really the best time for the live, for those of you who are wanting to do the Bible in a Year Challenge, we can keep it there. Um, I've considered moving it um, to the morning. So that if I do the Bible in a Year Instagram Live in the morning, then it can be posted and available to people after they do their Bible reading at any time during the day. And I've also um, considered possibly doing it maybe later in the evening, like 6.15 or 7 o'clock at night, so that the Instagram Live that I'm doing for the Bible in a Year does not go on at the exact same time as OT with DA. So I'm going to go ahead... And I'm going to create a poll in my story, and I'm going to ask all of you that are doing the Bible in a Year Challenge with me, what time works best for you? Because what I want to do is I want to do the live at a time that works best for everyone who enjoys being here, being in the chat, and being a part of the live. Uh, Marilyn Colacord saying, what time in the morning are you thinking of? I really haven't picked a time. Uh, you know what? We got 21 people on the Bible in a Year right now at 6.15. Um, we usually have anywhere between 20 and 30 people, so it looks like a majority of you that have been a part of this every day that have been on the Bible in a Year Challenge are here. How about you just put the time in the chat that would work best for you? Um, I would like to try not to do the Bible in a Year Instagram Live that we're doing every day at the same time that OT with DA is happening because there are some people who are doing OT with DA and they're also coming over and doing Bible in a Year. And so I would like to have the Bible in a Year Instagram happen at a time when it would be good for everybody else. Uh, now, I know not everybody's a morning person. Not everybody gets up first thing in the morning and reads their Bible. But if I do the Instagram live at like, eight or nine o'clock in the morning uh, Pacific Standard Time and then post the Instagram live that I do to YouTube and also um, if I post it to YouTube and everywhere else then people have it available and what you can do is you can do your daily Bible reading and you can tune in whenever the live happens but you know what I haven't made a final decision I haven't decided I'm gonna change the time I might leave it at 5.15 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I might change it. Um, somebody was saying tomorrow's OT with DA is at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. So what would happen is the Bible in a year would happen tomorrow at 5.15, and we'd be ending just in time for OT with DA to start. Uh, let me see. Someone else is saying 7 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. or evening, but days and evenings depends on work. Yeah, and that's another thing. There's a lot of people here that are in my time zone that have to work. So um, 5.15 in the evening usually works good for people when they're getting off work. Um, some people are saying, no, it would be good at 7 p.m. Uh, 
uh, one of my friends is saying, yes, I'm in London. I'm in England. And so if you did it in the morning, morning would work eight or nine for me. Okay. So um, I'm going to create, let's not take any more time of our uh, Bible in a Year Day 20 challenge worrying about what time we're going to do the daily Instagram live. Instead, let's go ahead and focus on what is most important. Oh, cool. We have some people from England. We have Australia here. We have people in Pendleton and Pilot Rock. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Uh, today, we are on day 20 of the Bible in a Year reading challenge. So excited to have all 20 of you here that are joining us. And today, day 20, we did Genesis 41, 17 through 42, 17. Now, we didn't really get a chance yesterday to cover Genesis 39 through 41, 16. So I did all of that today in preparation for this live. We are going to be diving into the story of Joseph. It is one of my favorite stories in the entire Old Testament. Can't wait to do that. Hello to all of you that are just now joining. We are just getting started with our Bible in a Year, Day 20 challenge where we are doing uh, readings from Genesis 41, 17 through 42, 17, Matthew chapter 13, 24 through 46. Oh man, I'm just going to tell you, guys, all right, if there has been any day on the Bible in a Year reading challenge where you need to be totally stoked for what's about to come at you to see the connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it is today to be able to see the connections between the teachings of Jesus and also the stories that are going on in the Old Testament. Today is your day. Okay, we also looked at Psalm uh, 18, 1 through 15, and Proverbs 4, 1 through 6. Now, I had a, I had uh, somebody send me a message today on my um, Facebook page, my pastor page, and they said, Pastor, I absolutely love the Bible in a year. It has been so good for me. I am loving the things that you're talking about. I am seeing new insights in God's Word. She said, you know, one suggestion. Please start your Bible in a Year Instagram live with prayer and end it with prayer. And I thought to myself, you know, I always pray just before I go on the live. And I usually pray for all of the people who are doing a Bible in a Year reading challenge after getting off the live because I'm praying, Lord, help me to see things in your word that are going to be a big blessing to the people that are taking the time to listen to this. And, and Lord, as they're doing the Bible in a Year challenge, as they're asking questions of Scripture and they're journaling and they're meditating on your word, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit in their lives. But you know what? I love that suggestion. So before we dive into Genesis today, let's just say a prayer. Heavenly Father, just pour out your Holy Spirit now and be with each and every single person that's watching on the live. Be with the people who are going to watch on YouTube, Facebook, uh, from the Instagram archive. However, they're going to come across the Bible in a Year reading challenge day 20 and this time with me. Lord, may my words be your words and may your Holy Spirit bring a clearer understanding of your word is my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. We got a lot to cover in Genesis. Um, I see some of my friends are here from Australia, England, the Philippines. Just want to give a shout out to Maricel, my friend from the Philippines who just jumped in here. Let's see. Oh, I got Cindy Jackson from Pilot Rock. My friend Marilyn from Pendleton. Um, oh, yeah, we got all kinds of good people in here. Uh, now, is it Natasha is from e London, England? Tell me if I'm saying your name right. Lisa's here. Deanna's here. Amanda's here. So many good people here. My buddy Edward is here. So excited. For all of you being here, thank you for joining me today because we are going to be covering uh, something absolutely amazing that I've discovered in the story of Joseph. Okay, so if you've done your Bible in a year reading already for today, you're going to end up going to Genesis chapter 39. And here's one of the things that I noticed today that I've never noticed before when reading this story. It just jumped out to me. Listen to this. So Joseph found favor... In the sight of Potiphar, right? It says, his master saw that the Lord was with him. Think about this. Potiphar saying, hmm, I can see that the Lord is with Joseph. Right? I can see that the Lord is with Joseph. And he can see that because of Joseph, 
he is becoming successful. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. He became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Now, think about what this is saying. And you're actually going to see this part of the narrative play out. Not only did Potiphar know that, that, um, not only did Potiphar know that Joseph was blessed by God and that his house was being blessed for Joseph's sake, but also later in the story, we're going to see that Pharaoh knew it. You guys, think about this. The people in Egypt knew about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hello? Joseph. Let's go through the story. Let's, let's look at what happened through Joseph. Potiphar's recognizing, hey, you know what? I recognize that the Lord is with Joseph. I recognize that everything Joseph does succeeds. I recognize that even though he's my slave, my house is becoming wealthy because of Joseph. So I'm going to put him in charge of everything, right? Okay, we go on in Joseph's story though, right? Because Joseph has been dealt a dirty hand. His brothers throw him in a pit. They sell him into slavery. Now he's in slavery with Potiphar. But is Joseph complaining? No. Instead, he's serving Potiphar and doing everything for Potiphar as if he's doing it for the Lord. And the Lord is blessing Joseph so much that his master puts him in charge of everything that he has. So it's almost like, hey, I may be a servant of this guy, but I'm living high on the hog because my master is withholding nothing from me because he knows that he's being blessed for my sake because the Lord is with me. He knows that the God of heaven is with me. Okay? Now, how many of us could take this and actually use a contemporary practical application and think about uh, what we do for work in our daily life? Friends, imagine if every day when we went to work, instead of working for the person that we're working for, we started doing everything that we did for the Lord and we made it known. By the way, I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I serve Jesus Christ. I live for him. I do what I do for him. I work the job that I do for him. I do everything with honor, integrity, and truth. I'm doing it for him. I want my God that I serve to be lifted up and glorified. He's the reason that I succeed. He's the reason that I'm blessed. Imagine what would happen. All right. Now, Joseph was very handsome, we know, right? And we see in the story, all of us know this story, that Potiphar's wife decides, ooh, I really like Joseph. He's looking good. So when Potiphar's out of the house, I'm going to try to sleep with Joseph, right? And we all know that Joseph did the right thing. He was like, no, 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 no. I'm not going into you. He told Potiphar's wife, not happening. But when he tried to flee out of the house, when she attempted to lie with him, what happens? She grabs his garment, she holds it in her hand, and then she makes up a crazy story. She accuses Joseph of trying to rape her. And when Potiphar comes home, he's really angry because he's like, hey, I put you in charge of all of my stuff and you do this to me? Now, Here's the thing that I actually saw today in this story that I've never really thought of before. I mean, it's obvious, but it's something that each and every single one of us need to be reminded of. Doing what is right won't always mean that you're going to be blessed or that it will bring you blessing immediately in this life and in this world. Friends, if you're going to choose to follow Jesus... If you're going to choose to be a Christian, if you're going to choose to stand for what God wants you to do, it's not always going to bring you blessing. And I hear so many preachers and pastors saying, oh man, go to church and praise the Lord and read your Bible and pray and everything's going to happen to you is going to be good. No. Friends, the Bible teaches us quite the opposite. The Bible tells us, we actually discovered it in the book of Matthew earlier. If you go back in our Bible in the Year Challenge, some of the readings we've done from the book of Matthew... Jesus makes it clear, hey, if you're going to pick up your cross and follow me, the people in this world will rebuke you. They will speak all manner of evil against you. They will treat you bad. There's going to be bad things that are going to happen. You're going to go through trial. I mean, look at Joseph's life. Thrown in the pit. Sold into slavery. Works for Potiphar. 
Potiphar sees that God is blessing him because of Joseph. Joseph is doing the right thing. He is working for his master with everything he's got in him. The Lord is blessing. Joseph is just climbing the ranks no matter what's going on. But then, what happens? Well, Potiphar's wife decides, hmm, Joseph is a good-looking young man, and I think I'd like to sleep with him. And even though Joseph does the right thing and flees from her, he does the right thing. It doesn't bring him immediate blessing. Friends, doing what God wants you to do will not always bring you immediate blessing in this world. In fact, sometimes standing for the truth, telling the truth, doing the right thing will be the thing that can cause you trouble in your life. But I want you to know something. My friend from England said it good. It always ends up being worth it in the end, though, doesn't it? Can I get an amen for that in the chat? All right. Now, for doing what is right, Joseph got thrown in prison. Is that a blessing? Well, maybe we need to look at the story a little bit different. Maybe we need to look at our lives differently. And I don't want to give away the punchline because we're actually coming close to the, my favorite scripture in all of the Old Testament Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 50, right? Okay. But it's better to be in prison for doing what is right than to be a prisoner in your own mind or a slave to sin. Friends, even though we know doing what God wants us to do, living righteous lives, following Christ, following the commandments, believing the Bible, teaching the Bible, preaching the kingdom of God, will cause people in this world to rebuke us, attack us, speak all manner of evil against us, not like us. Sometimes doing the right thing is going to bring you trouble. I'm going to tell you something. I'd rather be like Joseph and be locked up in prison for doing the right thing than be a prisoner in my own mind and a slave to sin by caving and doing what is right in man's eyes rather than doing what is right in God's eyes. Friends, it is better to sleep good at night in the prison cell that Joseph found himself in, knowing that you did the right thing, than it is to be a free person doing what people in this world want you to do. It is better to stand for God and to be persecuted than it is to fall victim to the delusion that if we do the things that are good in man's eyes, and it may make things better in the moment, that we actually then become slaves of sin ourselves we become prisoners of the guilt in our own mind that we carry for the wrong that we've done. All right, let's go along in the story here. Because Joseph ends up having several people in prison with him, right? People in prison with him are having dreams. And Joseph says, do not the interpretations of dreams belong to God? You see, Joseph, all throughout his life, he goes to prison. What does he do? He gains favor with the main jailer in the prison. He rises to the top to the point where he puts Joseph in charge of the prisoners, and then he doesn't even worry about it. I trust Joseph so much. Best prisoner I've ever had. I'm putting him in charge of everything. I'm not worrying about it. Everywhere Joseph goes, the Lord is with him. God gives him favor. It doesn't matter where he's at. It doesn't even matter that he ended up in prison because God gives him favor. Okay, here we go. So Joseph ends up interpreting the dream of the baker and the cupbearer. It comes true. But friends, I want to re I want to point out something in this story. Because when in the cupbearer was in prison, when the baker was in prison and they had the dreams, they wanted Joseph to give them the interpretation, didn't they? They wanted the interpretation. And here's a contemporary application to this story. Because what I noticed is, is when the cupbearer and the baker were in prison, we know the baker actually ended up being impaled, so he couldn't have really kept his promise and, and told Pharaoh that Joseph was in prison and could interpret dreams and help him get out, right? But when in the time of need, the cupbearer wanted to hear from God, he wanted Joseph to interpret the dream. But when he got out of jail and he got restored to his job, what happened? The moment he was restored to his job, the cupbearer totally forgets about his need for God, totally forgets about Joseph, totally forgets about his promise, totally forgets to tell Pharaoh about Joseph who interpreted the dreams. 
The cupbearer and the baker both knew that Joseph had the favor from God, could interpret dreams. But the minute the baker died and the minute the cupbearer was set free, he forgot him. He totally forgot his need for God. He totally forgot his need for the interpretation of his dream. He totally forgot his need. Friends, we are so often like this in our everyday lives. And I'm only bringing it up because I don't want you to live your lives missing out on the blessing of seeking God daily. That's why we're doing the Bible in a Year Challenge. That's why I'm encouraging you to spend time in the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalm, Proverbs, and pray for the Holy Spirit every day. It's because, friends, don't use God like a vending machine to solve your problems. Don't go to Jesus like the genie in the bottle that can come and get you out of jail or get you out of your financial trouble or heal you from the sickness or get you from that. Don't live your lives waiting to call to Jesus until you have problems because then when he blesses you, you will promptly forget him the same way you did before and go right back to the same problem you had in the beginning. Instead, live your lives in prayer, praise, and devotion to a God who wants to be with you and live in your life and give you success and bless you even when you're in the prison, even when you're sold into slavery, even when you're feeling sick even when your finances are gone, even when things are going bad. If you'll let Jesus into your life on a daily basis, friends, I got to tell you right now, you're going to get to live no matter where you're at or what you're going through with a Savior who's going to give you success even in the face of the attacks of the enemy. He did it for Joseph. He can do it for you. Don't be the cupbearer. Don't, don't come to the man of God saying, hey, man of God, please tell me my dream. Hey, man of God, pray for me and get me out of the Man of God, can you fix my problem? Man of God, da, 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 da. And then the minute God blesses you, forgotten, where's God? What happened now? See? And the thing is, is that God wants to be present in your life all the time because he wants to bless you all the time, even if you're going through hard things in your life. So please stop waiting. Because friends, we create habits. If you're in a habit of not having God a part of your daily life, and then you call in him, on him in time of need and he blesses you, he gives you the interpretation of your dream, he blesses your finances, he heals your sickness, right? The minute things go good, you'll forget him and you'll forget that he is the reason that things are good in your life. And I don't understand why we don't pray daily. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven for my life. Be a part of my life. I want to walk with you every day because then I know that no matter what's going on in my life, whether it's a good time or a bad time, whether I'm sick or whether I'm healthy, whether I'm rich or I'm poor, what, no matter what's going on in my life, whether I'm free or I'm locked up, it doesn't matter because if I've got you with me, Lord, if I know that I'm walking with you and I'm doing what's right, then no matter where I am, you're with me. And I know as a result, I'm going to have favor. I'm going to have success. So friends, don't be like the cupbearer. Don't be like that cupbearer. Don't be like him. All right, let's go on. Okay, what does he do? Pharaoh has a dream. Ding, 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 ding. Cupbearer remembers Joseph. Joseph gets taken out of prison. What does he say? He says to Pharaoh, the moment Joseph has an opportunity. Uh, no, you're not on the wrong day. I actually started on 39. So day 19. I started on Genesis 39 and I'm working my way through Genesis 42. We're almost to 42 now because I'm jumping to Genesis chapter 41 right now. And I want to go to Genesis 41 verse 16. And that is actually part just getting to day 20. Okay, here we go. What does Joseph say to Pharaoh when Pharaoh has his dream? It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer to his dream. All through Joseph's life, when he has big opportunities, what does he do? Hey, it's not about me. It's not about me. Let me remind you, the God that I serve... He is the one, right? He'll give you a favorable answer. He can interpret your dream. It's the God that I serve that gives me success. It's the God that I serve that makes me who I am. I am not good. When people come up to me, pastor, good sermon. Pastor, you're such a good pastor. No, 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 no. Listen, don't say that I'm good because listen, the only goodness that you see in me comes from my father in heaven. And Joseph is doing this throughout his entire life, pointing to God, pointing to God. 
pointing to God, pointing to God. Time and again, Joseph is pointing to God and he's saying, listen, God can give you the interpretation of your dream. He did it in the jail cell. He did it with Potiphar. He did it all through his life. No matter where he was going, no matter what success he was having, he was always pointing to God. Joseph knew that his favor, that his success, that the interpretations of dreams, that all good things belong to God, come from his hand. He wants to pour it out in our life. Friends, we are not good. God is good. And when we give our lives to him and let him live in and through us, then people see the goodness of God in us. Oh, let's let Jesus Christ be lifted up so that he'll draw all men and women to himself. That gets me excited. Let's keep going. I got a daily planner someone got for me. On the front of the daily planner, it says, be still and know that I am God. That is my favorite psalm in the entire Bible, right? It is, the, it is my favorite song in the entire Word of God. And the reason is, is because, friends, we got to learn to trust God. We got to learn to be still. We got to be putting our eyes on Jesus because, listen, he's the one that gives you favor. He's the one that is going to pour out his blessings in and through your life. And when we point to him, the beautiful thing about it is, one, we don't forget that God is the one giving us success. So we keep coming to him and we keep living in the blessings of God. And then, two... We end up drawing other people to God. We end up pointing, no, don't call me good. No, don't think I'm the one that can interpret your dream. No, don't think that I'm the one that can bring you good things. No, it's my God that gave me success. It's Jesus. It's the, it's the one that I follow, the one that spoke the entire world into existence and has given us all good things. He's the one. All right. We got to keep moving. Um, what I love about this is, friends, okay, here is the big epiphany I had from this story. I've got to just skip to this. It's my first time seeing this in the story because we know what happens. Pharaoh had a dream. He had two dreams. Joseph tells him, look, both of the dreams mean the same thing. He gives him the interpretation of the dream and he says, listen, Egypt is about to have seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, right? And he says, you're going to need to put someone in charge of all of Egypt to bring a blessing to Egypt to store up food so that when the time of famine comes, that you'll have plenty, not only for Egypt, but for people all over the world. Friends, you know what I saw today? The first time thinking of this, when reading this, I thought about history. God spoke through Joseph to Pharaoh. The Pharaoh knew that God was with Joseph. He said, listen, there isn't anybody wiser than you. There isn't any of my wise men that could tell me the meaning of my dream. There isn't anyone who serves the one true God like you do. He admits it out of his own mouth. Pharaoh knew that Joseph, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph was the God who had the power to interpret dreams and to save Egypt from famine and to save the world through Egypt from famine. And this makes the things that happen later in the story even more egregious. Because, friends, God blessed Egypt through Joseph, and they knew that Joseph served the one true God. God spoke through Joseph. The Pharaoh knew it. Everybody knew it. The story of Joseph was recorded in their history. Pharaoh admitted that Joseph had the spirit of God in him. He knew it. The history of Egypt showed that God blessed Egypt through the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Egyptians knew it. The pharaohs knew it. And they still continued to worship false gods. Friends, isn't that the world we're living in now? We live in a world full of people that know deep in their hearts that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Jesus Christ did come into this world. He died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. He's sitting on the throne. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. People know it. But we don't call out to God until the plane's going down. We don't want to admit that there's a God until there's a problem. We don't want God in our life until we need to make that 911 call. God, my finances aren't great. My health is bad. My marriage is falling apart. Things aren't working out. The plane is going down. Now I believe in God, right? But the pride of life, 
the Pharaoh, admits the Spirit of God is in Joseph. He interprets the dream. It's recorded in the history of Egypt. The Pharaohs know that the Spirit of God was with Joseph. God blesses the Egyptians, and then the Egyptians later in the story end up enslaving the very people of God, and they know they're doing it. They know they're doing it. They know they're hardening their hearts against the one true God and worshiping false gods because they prefer to live the lifestyle that the false gods allows them to live. Friends, that's the world we're living in now. People prefer, like Adam and Eve in the garden did, to be God and to be in charge of what is good and evil and to decide their own identity and to refuse to actually look to God the Father for their identity. Let's go to the book of Matthew. We're only going to have time just for a little bit of the book of Matthew because I got a birthday party that I'm going to tonight. Got to get there. Love to celebrate people's birthdays. Sometimes people forget I'm a pastor of two churches. Uh, I've got a school. I'm also a hospice volunteer in Pendleton Pilot Rock. And I love spending time in God's Word every day. I love spending time with all of you guys. But I also have to be present off of social media and with all of the people that I love right here in my every single day life. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? All right, here we go. Okay, parable of the weeds. Friends, I love the parables here. And we actually read from Matthew 13, day 20 is Matthew 13, 24 through 46. Check this out. Here is the promise that I want to claim today for each and every single one of us. Because Jesus tells at the beginning of Matthew chapter 13, remember, he told the parable of the sower, right? When we come to Jesus, we know that the old person that we used to be passes away, all things become new, right? And all of us who are born of the Spirit become part of the family of God. So then Jesus says, okay, you're a part of the family of God now. And in, in, in Matthew 13, he starts telling parables, right? And we see the parable of the sower. He gives the interpretation to his disciples. And here's the promise I want to claim for all of us. Write this down. Matthew 13, verse 17. You guys ready for this? Matthew 13, verse 17. This is my Bible promise that I'm praying for each and every single one of us today. Write it down, write it on your heart, write it in your minds, put it in your journal, get ready to claim it. Here we go. Here's what it says. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Yet you're seeing it and hearing it. <laughs> and then he explains the parable of the sower. And then he talks about the parable of the weeds. He said to them, an enemy has done this. Go to Matthew 13, starting in verse 24. We see the parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also, and the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them up? No, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together and tell the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Friends, we have to learn to quit taking stuff that God is doing into our own hands. I love what Marilyn just said. She says, I am making the choice to see and I'm making the choice to hear. Friends, when we actually choose to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we then begin to see and to hear the things of God. And the reason why Jesus is telling people, hey, you know what? Don't, don't pull up the weeds. Don't try to discern for yourself good from evil. It's because he's telling us, stop playing God. Because in the process of trying to figure out who you think is good and who you think is evil... You pull up a lot of the wheat along with the weeds. If we would just focus our eyes on Jesus and we would ask him to show us what it is that he has for us. If we would just wait on the Lord like Cindy Jackson just said. If we would quit taking things into our own hands and instead of worrying about who's good and bad, we would just turn our eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. The things of this earth would grow strangely dim. 
Okay. And then he talks about the mustard seed. You know what I love about faith? When we actually choose faith, it's like a mustard seed that the Lord plants his faith in our life. But in Matthew um, 13, 31, and 32, it actually says here that the mustard seed is the smallest seed. But when planted in good soil, it grows and becomes this big tree. The longer that I walk with Jesus, the more my faith grows. The longer that I walk with Jesus, the more I know the Father. Jesus said, if you know me, you know the Father. The Holy Spirit is going to come to you. He's going to lead you into all truth. Friends, the longer we walk with Jesus, the longer we sing that song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine, this is my story, this is my song, the more we get to know him, the greater the faith grows in our life. And I want to claim it today that while God plants the faith of Jesus in our life, it may be the size of a mustard seed, but faith is planted by God, and it may start small, but I want to claim over all of our lives that between now and the end of eternity, that little seed is going to grow infinitely. Friends, when we go to heaven, we're going to keep learning about God. We're going to keep growing in our love for him. We're going to keep growing in our faith. We're going to keep seeing deeper and deeper depths of what it means that God is love. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh man, I can't wait for heaven. All right, here's today's promise. Here's today's promise. Matthew 13, I accidentally said yesterday's promise. Here's today's promise. Matthew 13, 35. Write that one down. Matthew 13, 35. Here's what it says. This was, to fill, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Friends, do you realize... I don't even have time to talk about the rest of the parables. I got to go. But do you realize, here's the promise we're going to claim, and then I'm going to pray, and we're going to close this thing for today. There were so many good things in Psalm. There were so many good things in the Proverbs reading. There were so many good things in the Matthew reading. There are so many Bible lessons in the story of Joseph, friends. And here's where we bring it all together because Joseph lived his life keeping his eyes on God and saying, hey, it's the God I serve that interprets the dreams. It's the God that I serve that brings me favor. It's the God that I walk with daily, even when I'm in the pit, even when I'm sold into slavery, even when I'm falsely accused, even when I'm sitting in prison, even when I'm standing before the Pharaoh and I've got the opportunity of a lifetime to to possibly get out of prison by interpreting his dream, he's going to say, you know what? Don't come to me. Don't look at me. There's no good thing in me alone. I, I know a God who can interpret your dream. And in that moment, friends, we end up coming to a realization that is actually said by Jesus to us. It's like Marilyn said earlier on the live. She said, hey, I choose to see. I choose to hear. Why? I'm praying daily for the Holy Spirit because I know that God is love and I want to know the things that he knows. I want to get to know Jesus because by knowing Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, I get to know the Father too. And when I'm with my God, he opens my eyes to understand the things of God. And here's what the promise is right here. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Matthew 13, 35, promise of the day. Here we go. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what was hidden since the foundation of the world, and you're going to understand it, friends, as we're spending time praying daily for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we are spending time doing our Bible in a Year Challenge as we are reading these parables, as we are reading the Old Testament words that were, were, were preserved and passed down, as we are reading the Word of God, we are having the hidden truths of the foundations of His kingdom and the world open to our eyes, our minds, our ears, and our understanding so that we can preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as a witness to all the nations, so that people can come to Jesus and know Him, so that people who are now lost in darkness can walk into the light. He said, you're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its flavor, what is it good for other than to be thrown out and trampled by men? Friends, I want to challenge you to realize that in these parables that we are covering, the Holy Spirit reveals the secrets of the kingdom of God so that we can be a part of it now. Friends, today is the first day of eternity. Today is the day that Jesus can be lifted up in our life. Today is the day that we can be the light in this world that will lead people to Jesus and to eternal life. Don't wait any longer. Don't wait until things get bad to call out to God. Don't wait. Don't forget God. Don't live a life where you just do the 911 Jesus kind of lifestyle, but instead 
Like we talked about earlier, claim this promise. I want to know the parables. I want to see the things of God. I want to hear the things in his word. And when you do that, you claim that promise right here in the book of Matthew 13, 35. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And through the Holy Spirit, friends, we get to understand it. Man, he says, you know, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. But instead, I'm calling you friends. Because a master makes known to his disciples, to his friends, the secrets of his kingdom. You guys, when you give your life to Jesus and you get that faith the size of a mustard seed planted in your life, you get born again. Become sons and daughters of the living God. He says, I'm calling you friends. You're not my slaves. You're not my servants. I'm not a dictator. I want to make the things of my kingdom, the parables that have been hidden, the understanding of my kingdom that's been hidden. I want to open your eyes and your ears. And friends, when we pray daily for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and we spend time in God's word, when we are living lives of prayer, praise, and devotion to the one true God, he opens our eyes and ears and we understand the very things of his kingdom and we become the salt of the earth, we become the light to the world, we become those who preach the gospel of the kingdom into all the world as witness to all the nations. We get to be a part of the most exciting thing. We get to be like Joseph and be blessed in all that we do, no matter who we're working for, no matter where we go, no matter what happens. Sometimes, yeah, I'll tell you what, we get thrown in pits. We get, we get falsely accused. We have bad things happen. But friends, keep your eyes upon Jesus and go after him with everything you got. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for our Bible in a Year Challenge. Thank you for Day 20. Thank you for the readings we've done together. Thank you for the thousands of people around the world. We got people from Australia. We got people from the Philippines. We got people from London. We got people from England. I just want to challenge everybody that's on right now. Type in the chat while we're praying, where are you from? Because wherever you are, whatever you're doing right now, we're claiming this promise and blessing. God, open our eyes and ears to understand the parables of your kingdom. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us understand it. Pour out your light through us. Help us to be the salt of the earth. So that other people can see Jesus and have eternal life is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless everybody. Have a wonderful night. We got people from California. We got people from Pendleton. We got Canada in the house. We got the Philippines in the house. We got New Jersey in the house. Amen and amen. Oh, man. And we're all a part of the kingdom of God. Can you believe that? Let's go. We got Australia in the house. We've got London. We we got Vegas. We got, uh, is it Minnesota? Am I? No, Michigan. Perth, Australia. <laughs> Woo! Hey, I love all of you guys. I'm going to see you tomorrow at 5.15. We're going to be on at the regular time tomorrow. Tomorrow, 5.15 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I found out that OT with DA is going to be going live at 7, so that means he will be starting tomorrow night at 6. We will be on from about 5.15, right up until about when OT with DA starts. God bless all of you. Keep reading your Bibles every day. Don't worry if you've fallen behind because, hey, all of these videos are archived on the Pendleton Adventist Church YouTube channel. They're archived on the Pendleton Adventist Church Facebook page. They're on Pastor Stephen William Farr's Facebook page and my personal Facebook page and archived in my Instagram. The videos are everywhere. The Bible plans are available for you on the Linktree link in my bio. If you don't have one of the Bible in your reading plans yet, go into the Linktree in my Instagram bio. Click the link. We have the 8.5 by 11 Bible in a Year reading plan there available for you to download in PDF format and print it out. We also have the, what is it, the 11 by 17 or the 14 by 17. We also have the larger one available for you. Go down the Bible, don't go download the Bible in a Year reading plan. Encourage your friends to start reading the Bible in a Year. It's never too late to start reading your Bible in a Year. And all of the videos for the Instagram Lives are archived, so it's never too late to start. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful night. I'm going to a birthday party. See you later.